Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A Breath of Fresh Air, Approaches to Doubling Lung Utilization. We're glad that all of you could join us, and we have a very insightful presentation planned for you today. My name is Corey Bryant, Director of Communications for the Alliance, and I'd like to take a moment to recognize our sponsor for today's webinar. Exvivo Perfusion is a medical technology company focused on developing optimized solutions for organ, tissue, and cell preservation and perfusion in connection with transplantation. With more than 20 years of experience, Exvivo is dedicated to providing more effective, clinically proven, and innovative products that increase the availability of acceptable donor organs and improve patient survival. For more information, visit exvivoperfusion.com. Now I'd like to hand it over to Deanna Finden, Program Manager here at the Alliance, to go over some of the logistical items for today's webinar. Thank you, Corey. Before we begin today's presentation, there are just a few housekeeping items that I'd like to review. For optimal visual and audio experience, these webinars are best accessed in the Chrome browser. If at any point you encounter any audio issues, we recommend logging back in using Chrome. If the audio issues persist, please call in using the phone number provided in your confirmation email. Now, for those of you who have never joined us on this webinar platform before, please take note of this chat feature that is located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This chat can be used to pose your questions to our speaker. If you have any questions that come up during the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation is complete, we'll have some time for our presenter to address as many of your questions as time allows. Now, for those of you who may be interested in our upcoming webinars, registration is currently open for our next webinar entitled, Why Does Social Support Matter for Transplant? That's coming your way on April 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Registration is also open for an upcoming webinar entitled, Anatomy of a Donation Champion. So be sure to join us for that on May 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can register for all these webinars and more on our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now for anyone seeking continuing education credits, please note we are offering one SEPSI credit and one nursing contact hour for this webinar. Everyone joining us today is entitled to claim these credits. If you're listening in a group, as many of you are, please make sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. There is a very brief online evaluation which will allow you to receive your credit. As a reminder, for nursing you have 14 days to claim your credits, and for SEPSI you have 30 calendar days. Now at this point in time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Dan Lebovitz, Medical De Director at LifeBank. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today, and at this point, I'd like to turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Deanna, and I'd like to thank you and Leanne, as well as the Alliance, for inviting me to moderate this presentation. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce a colleague and friend, Dr. Samir Latifi, as the presenter for today's webinar. Uh, Dr. Latifi is a graduate of medical school at Guy's Hospital at the University of London. He traveled to the United States to complete his pediatric residency and pediatric critical care fellowship at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, where I first had the pleasure of meeting Samir. He continued on as a pediatric critical care faculty member at Rainbow Babies and Children's until 2004 when he returned to London with his family to live and practice critical care. He spent a year at the Royal Brompton Hospital uh, doing pediatric cardiac intensive care then moved to Cambridge University Hospitals where he became the medical director of the pediatric ICU and be, became involved in the local organ and tissue donation council there. In 2010-11, he began to be more involved in the organ and tissue donation uh, in, in the UK when he was appointed as the regional clinical lead for organ donation in that area around Cambridge. He returned to the United States and back to Cleveland in 2012 joining the faculty uh, in pediatric critical care at Akron Children's Hospital, soon after became the Associate Medical Director for LifeBank, where I had the opportunity to work with Samir again. Um, since that time, he's continued national involvement in organ and tissue donation as a local, regional, and national speaker on the subject. He's been involved in the Organ Donation Research Consortium, which is now the council for AOPO, um, and as a researcher in the area of organ donor management in areas of inflammatory and vascular microcirculation, uh, effects of the brain death process, and in the area of lung recruitment and donation, participating in numerous multi-OPO research projects as well as numerous local projects. 
In 2017, he became the chairman of the Pediatric Critical Care Department at the Cleveland Clinic, and he continues to focus his research in the areas of lung donation and recruitment for the purposes of organ donation. He joins us today to share some of his thoughts on how we may increase lung donation from deceased donors to try to decrease loss of life on the waiting list. It's my pleasure to present my friend and colleague, Samir Latifi. Samir? Yeah, thanks very much, Dan, and to the uh, Donor Alliance for this opportunity to speak to everyone um, about something that's very passionate to both uh, Dan and myself. So the title of the um, presentation, A Breath of Fresh Air, Approaches to Doubling Lung Utilization, which might sound like a very lofty goal, but hopefully by the end of this seminar, your uh, participants will be pretty convinced that this is something that's really very doable and pretty quickly. So um, I have no financial um, or other conflicts of interest to disclose. Get that out of the way. So to start with some background, uh, I think we all um, kind of know what is our ideal lung donor. Generally, we're looking for a PaO2 to FiO2, or PF ratio, more than 300, uh, a clear chest X-ray, and minimal to sort of non-infected tracheal secretions and low vent settings, ideally, hopefully, so peak pressures no more than the low 20s. And as you'll notice on the slides, any time I, if there's some references, they're kind of listed down there at the, at the bottom of the slide, so um, as to where my um, information was um, sourced from. So then some more background. Uh, hopefully we're, a lot of us are already familiar with this data, but I thought it'd be good to just recap what happened in 2018 in relation to um, lung transplantation. So there was uh, 36, 530 organs transplanted, of which 2,530 were lungs. And these lungs came from 10,721 donors. So that means only about 23% of deceased donors, that is, um, were actually lung donors. But there's still uh, about 1,500 people on the wait list, um, which is a problem, and 20% of them unfortunately pass away while waiting, and that's something that we really want to try and tackle. So the objectives uh, we sort of set ourselves or set myself for this presentation is first um, to develop an understanding of the inflammatory and pathophysiological changes in the lung function of the neurologically deceased donor. Um, when it comes to DCD, really uh, opioids have no role during the uh, you know pre uh, pronouncement of the patient and the management of the donor, so I'm not going to focus on that part. Um, develop an approach to treat all donors as potential lung donors by utilizing a structured approach to lung recruitment, and to become familiar with the use particularly of APRV, which is airway pressure release ventilation for lung recruitment. So what could be the reasons for suboptimal donor lung function that only about you know one fifth of our donors actually are successful lung donors. So it could be that they have pre-existing medical conditions such as asthma or maybe a history of smoking that's led to emphysema. Uh, perhaps they've already been in the ICU for a week and have developed a uh, nosocomial pneumonia. Uh, so there's a number of factors that uh, may be contributing to poor lung function. Then uh, it could also be, uh, you know, what was the cause of death? Was this a severe trauma where there's uh, been a flail chest and contusions to the lung and pneumothorax? Maybe there's been some hemorrhage, uh, pulmonary hemorrhage. So, you know, has there been bad heart failure that's led to significant pulmonary edema? Or is pulmonary edema maybe secondary to a head injury with neurogenic pulmonary edema? And then especially those patients who have been sitting in the ICU for a while before they're pronounced neurologically deceased, there's the um, ventilator-induced injury, um, and as I already mentioned about um, secondary infections due to having plastic hardware down your airway. Um, and uh, 
when we talk about ventilator-induced injury, this also comes into our strategy of APRV. Um, you know, how are we trying to minimize that to see if we can recruit lungs to be, take them from marginal to being uh, potentially suitable for transplantation. And then there's also all the aspects that happen during brain death that will also contribute to um, uh, lung injury. So, on the next slide, yeah. So, in this slide, I want to focus on the effect of, um, you know, what is the effect of brain death physiology on lung function? And um, when brain death is a process, it's, it sort of doesn't happen over just like one hour, it's happening over many hours. And during that time, there's the catecholamine storm, there's the dysregulation of neurohumoral factors. There's massive pro-inflammatory cytokine release, and kind of all of these taken together lead to an increase in the vascular endothelial permeability, uh, which means, so in my lay language, meaning leaky blood vessels, and that's creating pulmonary edema that can either be neurogenic in origin, it could be cardiogenic, or it can be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. The other thing is in the uh, neurologically deceased uh, donor, uh, there's no spontaneous respirations. There's no cough, there's no gag. Um, and so this leads to a pooling of secretions um, promoting atelectasis. And this atelectasis is what's going to lead to um, desaturation of the blood and hypoxemia and, and worsening lung compliance. Can I have the next slide, Deanna? I've lost the connection. Okay. Um, so um, the next thing then is, so how do we overcome these issues during donor management, and can we really double our lung utilization? Can I have the next slide, Deanna? So um, this data that I'm showing on this slide, this is the LifeBank O to E, uh, sort of observed to expected data for organs. And um, the main point I want to show you here is, as you can see with the kind of yellow star, um, this is uh, our O to E for lungs is 2.2. Uh, .2. uh, so that means we're, we're getting about double the amount of lungs compared to uh, the sort of average OPOs uh, based upon the SRTR. And as I go through the presentation and talk about what is the, um, this effect, that it doesn't impact the recovery of our other organs. Um, those are still good. And um, that this is really a very doable goal, that we can sort of double our um, lung utilization. Yeah, so um, it's worth bearing in mind that we've actually managed uh, to do this before. We've managed to double lung utilization. And so uh, um, just going to go over some history. I think a lot of people may have heard of the San Antonio Lung Transplant Donor Management Protocol, the SALT. And this was first reported uh, by Angel et al. in um, 2006 in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. And what they were able to do is to improve their proportion of lung donors from 11.5 to 25.5%. And one of the key features um, in this was recruitment maneuvers, where for uh, two hours, they put the PEEP to 15 and then had a pressure control of 25. So that means a peak inspiratory pressure of, you know, the, of uh, 40, so the 25 plus 15. They did that for two hours. Uh, as a lung recruitment maneuver. Now, there was a lot more to the uh, donor uh, lung management protocol, and, and I'll cover some of that in the coming slides. But as you can see, with that, they were able to achieve that 25.5%, so a doubling of what had been the historical lung utilization. And if you remember my earlier slide, I showed you that now, sort of nationally, we're around that sort of 20, 23% mark. 
So I think OPOs nationally have, have pretty much embraced this, um, the attitude of um, what was demonstrated in this paper. So the big question is, can we now take it you know, up to the 40%? Can I have the next slide, uh, Deanna? So um, what are some of the respiratory goals um, that we want to set ourselves? And really, it's all about mindset. We need to take the approach that as soon as we start managing a, a neurologically deceased donor, that all donors are potential lung donors until proven otherwise. And what we've done at LifeBanger that what is really a lot of what's incorporated as part of the SALT and which many um, uh, other reports have been published showing similar effects as what the San Antonio group first did. But some of the general principles that you want to do is, is, is uh, what I call kind of the basics. You want the head up 30 degrees. You want to have the endotracheal tube cuff inflated to 25 centimeters of water to prevent aspiration, so there's sort of ongoing issues uh, with that um, during the donor management. Uh, we want to do early and repeated bronchoscopy as necessary with minimal saline lavage. Um, and nowadays, uh, many ICUs, their intensivists, have, um, you know, sometimes that used to be quite difficult to find someone to do bronchoscopy, but now many ICU docs are trained um, in bronchoscopy and, and have the equipment right there in the ICU. Um, general care issues as well is using albuterol, um, mucor mist um, as necessary for mucus clearance, and doing chest physiotherapy, suctioning, and positioning like every four hours is, seems to be pretty much the standard with most OPOs. Then there's the uh, use of adjunct uh, medications. I think corticosteroids is um, well established giving, um, there tends to be varying doses, but it's pretty high dose. Um, solumedrol tends to be the most common um, steroid use. Then I, uh, I, I used to sh write down the word naloxone during this presentation, but now I've got a, a big line through it. And this is a little bit of giving a plug uh, to, I think, something that was achieved with the ODRC. Um, I have to give credit to uh, Dr. Dar uh, in the uh, St. Louis for uh, working with us at ODRC and bringing many OPOs together. And um, the result, this was 199 donors that were looked at, um, and there was a randomized um, controlled trial for the use of naloxone um, to see if it changed um, oxygenation. And basically, it didn't. And I've got the reference down there for you to see. So um, maybe that will lead to some cost savings for some OPOs. But now we have good evidence that it really doesn't appear to change um, oxygenation. And so it's nice that, you know, as OPOs, we're now starting to look at and answer our own questions. Another tricky part is the fluid status. Um, you know, the kidneys need lots of fluid, and uh, you want to keep the body well hydrated and, and peeing well. But then at the same time with the donor, the more fluid you give, then the wetter the lungs get. And that you know, can worsen the, the pulmonary edema that's there. And so that doesn't help that part. So really what we're aiming for is euvolemia. And what we often end up doing is giving quite a bit of fluids and at the same time sometimes giving diuretics, so keeping it going, um, going into the body and also coming out and not collecting in the lungs. Uh, could I have the next slide, Deanna? So the next thing is then, um, so that's kind of general management, but what do we do with the ventilator? And what are our, our sort of blood gas goals? So we're trying to aim for during donor management is um, normal ventilation and oxygenation. So we want to aim for a normal pH, um, normal CO2, and generally saturations of, sort of 95% and above. This is so that also we can maintain good oxygenation of the blood and therefore good oxygen supply to all the other organs that we're trying to um, recover potentially. But we also want to limit our ventilator-associated complications. So one thing is, for example, oxygen toxicity. 
Um, I already mentioned a big problem with the pooling and secretions is that lactases. But as I talk about the recruitment strategies and we get these alveoli recruited, we don't want to leave our donors on a high FiO2 of oxygen, um, such as 100%, because then what we're doing is filling the alveoli with 100% oxygen rather than air, which has got some nitrogen in it. Because if you stay on that 100%, the oxygen will get absorbed through the alveoli, and then they start to collapse, and then you've got your problem back again. So that's resorption atelectasis. So generally, we want to um, aim to get the FiO2 down to 40%. So the, the lower we can, the better it is for the lungs. Then we also want to avoid barotrauma. Generally, we want to keep plateau pressures um, below 30. And ideally, by the time we're making lung offers, we've got peak pressures in the um, 20. And then um, we want to avoid large uh, tidal volumes, so uh, volume trauma. So ideally, keeping within the 6 to 8 mLs per kilo of the ideal body weight. Come to the next slide, please. Uh, so how do we get that, um, you know, with the previous two slides, that management, pro uh, what I outlined, is really for OPOs, we need to create um, a protocol for your donor lung management. Like I said, if you take the approach that every donor is a lung donor and you just start this um, right from the beginning. So at LifeBank, this is just one page. It's uh, from our donor management guidelines. Uh, the respiratory part takes up about 12 pages. So, um, But the reason I picked this page and that I just circled with the highlights was um, that a lot of our donor management is driven by what is the PF ratio when we start um, donor management. So if our first blood gas shows a PF ratio, is, it's great. It's already uh, more than 350. Then we um, convert to a pressure-controlled mode of mechanical ventilation, and we just stay on an ITE of 1 to 1. If the PF ratio is like 200 to 350, then we um, really rapidly increase the PEEP, uh, aim to get up to 15. And this is really over a, sort of a couple of hours, a few hours. Um, as fast as possible. And, but as we increase the PEEP, a lot of times as we start management of a donor, usually um, due to all that catecholamine storm and the cytokines, they tend to be vasodilated and often need quite a bit of fluid resuscitation before they will tolerate um, this incremental increase in PEEP. Uh, and sometimes, you know, if we try to rush too quickly, we, we really don't have the patient's euvolemic and have the hemodynamics um, stabilized. It can turn into, hey, we tried to increase the mean airway pressure, they didn't tolerate it, they desaturated and blood pressure dropped, and then people give up on lung recruitment. So it's important to take care of the hemodynamics and make sure the uh, volume status is, is adequate. And nowadays, uh, there's often tools such as minimally invasive hemodynamic monitoring, such as the um, flow track, uh, PICO, and uh, other systems that we can use to help guide that. And then on the far right, where we have the PF ratio less than 200, um, you can see uh, the, where I've circled with the highlighter, change to or maintain APRV mode of ventilation. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Could I have the next slide, please? So what is APRV, or as uh, Dan and I often like to refer to it, is um, extreme uh, pressure control inverse ratio ventilation. And this is really basically a pressure mode of mechanical ventilation, um, which I think a lot of us should all be familiar with. You have um, a peak uh, pressure or a P high that's used during the inspiratory phase of uh, APRV. And then you have a P low, which would be like your PEEP that you set for the expiratory phase. But what with APRV we do is we set these in an inverse ratio of ventilation. So all of us right now, as we're breathing normally, we tend to have a, an inspiratory time to expiratory uh, ratio, maybe like one to three. And what we're doing is um, we want to reverse that. Um, so it becomes that you spend most of your time in inspiration like three or four or five to 
one and only one part of that respiratory cycle in exhalation. So that gives very little time for CO2 clearance. That's the whole point of um, exhalation time is to allow CO2 clearance. But I'm going to cover that in the next couple of slides, why that isn't so important once someone's neurologically deceased. Um, the other thing about the short release time or time in the P low is to prevent the uh, airways from really collapsing and allowing the intrinsic P enough time to drop down to zero. Thus, we're, what we're trying to do there is to prevent the de-recruitment of the lungs. And therefore, as I said, this is a pressure control of mechanical ventilation, so it's pressure limited, time cycled, and time triggered. Can I have the next slide? Thanks. So in the top graph is, just want to kind of go through what is uh, APRV um, in as it's used in the ICU um, with a spontaneously breathing patient. So with the uh, blue line, as you can see, during the P high, you have the little dips. That's because the patient is allowed to breathe spontaneously. And this is what allows the additional washout of carbon dioxide uh, in addition to the short period uh, when the line drops down to the P low zero. Um, as you can see on, on that top line, so they're spending from the uh, second second to the eight seconds, so six seconds during, in T high, but the patient's able to breathe spontaneously. However, when we have in the bottom uh, graph, we see in the non-breathing patient, so someone who's um, brain dead, the brain is the organ that tends to have the highest oxygen consumption, and therefore pre produces the most carbon dioxide. So because a brain dead donor does not produce as much carbon dioxide, we're able to get away with that short release time and clear enough CO2 and generate enough tidal volume and minute ventilation, therefore, that we can maintain a normal pH and CO2 while spending a lot of time, the majority of the respiratory cycle in inspiration, so inverse ratio of ventilation. So that's what we see with the lower chart. There's no, no spontaneous breathing. And this is pressure against time. And so you can see during the I time of the T high, um, the peak pressure is, uh, there's no spontaneous breathing. And then we have the short release, the T low. Um, that in this example is only one second. But that can be enough to allow the CO2 clearance. And what this does is by spending most of the inspiratory cycle with the high pressure, this allows us to have an overall high mean airway pressure, and this is what allows for sustained lung recruitment. So then if I can go to the next slide. And that sustained lung recruitment and high mean airway pressure is what allows uh, the sort of reversal of the atelectasis and getting the lung recruited, and that's what improves oxygenation. And then as that happens as more lung opens up, then you're able to lower the P high uh, while maintaining the same tidal volume because you've recruited more lung, and that allows you to minimize the peak inspiratory pressures as opposed to a normal ratio of ventilation. So that's the goal, one of the advantages that I'm talking about. So how do you set um, APRV? Uh, what's some of the more uh, sort of settings to start with? So what you do is you set the P high, and what you, do, you look at is, while you're on the conventional mode of mechanical ventilation, what kind of peak pressures were you hitting? And that's generally where you want to set your P high. And if the PIP is really high and it's kind of worried, it's already up into the 30s, maybe you want to start with it one or two points lower for your P high. And if you're on a volume control mode, what you can do is check a plateau pressure, which is obtained by doing an inspiratory hold and see what that is, and that is what becomes your P high setting. Um, generally, you don't want to go below a minimum of 20, but like I said, avoid the high peak pressures so like uh, over 35. And then depending on what kind of tidal volumes you get, then you can adjust it in increments of one to two to maintain the mean airway that hopefully um, you'll end up with a slightly lower peak and spiritual pressure, but actually a higher mean airway pressure than you were on, on conventional ventilator. And then you want to set the P low to zero. So that's easy. 
the T high generally you start with about four to six seconds and the T low is between 0.5 to 0.8 seconds, so usually 0.6. And usually that gives you an inverse ratio of about five or six to one um, to start off with. The other key thing about helping you set the T low is you need to look at the expiratory flow rate termination. You want this to be about 50% of the peak expiratory flow. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you what that is. The other thing about once you set APRV, um, you want to recheck your blood gas in about two hours and then check a chest X-ray to make sure that um, you're not over-inflating and, uh, the lungs because you've raised, generally what you've done when you go to APRV is you're raising the mean airway pressure by quite a bit. So those are sort of important things to keep in the back of your mind that you can't just do those changes and, and forget about it or wait four hours. The first time, generally in two hours, we check a blood gas and a chest X-ray. Can I have the next slide? Yeah. So in this, uh, um, slide, we can see what I mean by looking at the expiratory flow waveform. So uh, you have the T high, so now what we're looking at is actually the flow on the Y axis and along the X axis is time. So we have the T high and you can see it's a decelerating flow pattern. So the flow goes, turns on and then it starts to drop. Um, and in this example, it goes a little bit up and down because this is someone who's breathing spontaneously. But what I want you to focus on is the, the um, sharp drop below the baseline, which is the peak expiratory flow starts um, before the next breath uh, starts. That's during your T low. And what you want is by the time the next breath starts, you want to have about 50% of that expiratory flow to have happened. So you don't want it to return to baseline, which is what we do with conventional ventilation in someone who's alive. You want to give them enough time to exhale. Um, here you want to aim for the peak expiratory flow to be about 50%. So the range is 25 to 75, ideally hoping for about 50%, but patients or donors, lung mechanics, it's rare to allow you to get those perfect numbers, but the range of 25 to 75% is acceptable, but you don't want to go less than 25%. And the reason for that, and that's what helps you decide what your T low should be. Um, you, it, you can basically measure and, and get a sense of how much time does it take for the peak expiratory flow to drop to about 50% of where it was at the most. And you can always ask your RT to show you the flow waveforms and to figure that out. And the reason we don't like it to drop too low, um, below that 20, uh, really below that 50%, but at least uh, is you don't want the alveoli to start collapsing during that exhalation phase. Um, and generally, in a neurologically deceased donor, this allows you this um, exhalation, even though it's short, generates enough tidal volume that you can read that it clears the CO2 and allows you to uh, maintain a normal PaCO2 and, and pH. So that's a pretty lengthy explanation about um, APRV. So I'm going to have the next slide. But then what happens sometimes, especially when we're in um, some of our smaller uh, donor hospitals, is the RT comes up and says, hey, our vents don't do that. Um, and it, that's where I you know, strongly suggest you know, talk with your medical director and get them to help. But um, this, uh, the concept of APRV is, is, called, is really it's an extreme inverse ratio of ventilation, and different um, ventilators have different names for it. So for like Puritan Bennett, it's called bilevel. Uh, on the servos, um, now they have the servo U, uh, replacing the servo I, and that's uh, on that particular brand, it's called Bivent. The Drager, uh, who came out originally with APRV, um, so that's the, so again, it's um, it's not in the name. It's what we're trying to do is aim for inverse ratio of ventilation, and as we explain that to the RTs, then you'll find that yes, you, the ventilator in that ICU will be able to achieve that. Okay, have the next slide. So what are maybe some of the contraindications, or what are the things that we worry about when we go to this extreme uh, pressure control inverse ratio of ventilation? I've already hinted to some of these. You know, we want to make sure our donors are hemodynamically stable and are fluid resuscitated. So, but 
if despite that you're having hypertension hemodynamic instability, you don't want to be rushing into you know, high peeps and, and, and converting to an inverse ratio ventilation. The other thing is now, uh, you know, untreated pneumothorax, if there's a known bronchopleural fistula, so, you know, if this was a trauma patient and had um, a pleural leak, uh, again, not the best mode for uh, a, a donor who's got these problems. And that's because you've got that high mean airway pressure with a longer inspiration, so you're just going to really perpetuate that air leak and, um, and uh, continue to cause problems. The other thing is sometimes when there's unilateral lung disease, I think we see this often with our trauma patients, um, where you know, let's say the trauma is all on the left side and that's badly contused because when you have that high mean airway pressure, preferentially most of that's going to get exposed to the good lung and then you're exposing the good lung to very high airway pressures that might not be good for it and therefore you're causing barrier trauma. So again, a sort of word of caution there. And then, of course, um, as we know, patients with severe POD, COPD um, want to avoid that because, again, the high mean airway pressures may cause pneumothorax, and then that will lead to hemodynamic instability, and then you can lose your donor. So um, these are some of the caveats, therefore, about um, being careful about using uh, APRV. Um, but many of these conditions might actually then exclude that donor from being a lung donor as well. So can uh, have the next slide, please, Diane? Yeah. So the advantage is just to recap those, um, to be sort of um, finished talking about APRV on a more positive note, is um, it improves oxygenation by increasing your mean airway pressure. It increases and maintains that by hope, uh, hopefully over time as you recruit more lungs, leading to a lower peak inspiratory pressure. Um, you're able to maintain minute ventilation because uh, a neurologically deceased donor doesn't make as much CO2, and um, also this lower minute ventilation equates to less ventilation of dead space. And as I said, recruits the collapsed alveoli, and for the brain-dead donor who's not breathing spontaneous, spontaneously by spending most of the respiratory cycle in inspiration on the high mean airway, which is basically like being on continuous CPAP with a short release for exhalation, this means we're getting almost constant uh, lung recruitment. Um, so this is one strategy of doing lung recruitment. And the reason we like APRV is it's, it's basically a continuous sustained recruitment as opposed to going in maybe you know once every two hours doing a sustained inflation. So this is why at LifeBank we've just taken this approach that it's just a constant recruitment that's taking place. At the next slide. So the next series of slides, uh, I just want to show you that this isn't all just theory. Um, and I'd like to send, uh, uh, thank Dan for sharing some slides of a presentation that he did uh, of this data um, at the 2010 International Transplant Congress, which was the LifeBank's experience about an aggressive lung recruitment protocol uh, increases lungs for transplantation with no adverse effects in recipients. Um, this is often a concern of um, uh, lung transplant uh, physicians and surgeons that, you know, this APRV is you're going to be damaging the lungs and then this isn't going to be good for our recipients. So um, the next series of slides is really to show that that is not the case. So I can have the next slide. So back in sort of 2008-9, uh, Dan came up, you know, the hypothesis with the folks at LifeBank was that introduction of an aggressive lung management protocol using advanced mechanical ventilator recruitment, meaning aka the APRV, would increase your PF ratio and therefore increase lung acceptance rates by the transplanting surgeons. So can I have the next slide? So the methods for this was, you know, first uh, a detailed sort of review of what was current donor management um, and ventilator strategies, looking at the literature. APRV in the two th early 2000s was the new thing uh, in the ICU. Uh, who were the OPOs that were doing well? Uh, Dan touched base with them in terms of uh, sort of the higher OTEs for lung and discussed with ICU experts, um, developed a lung management protocol, and then Another very key component was then to talk with your local lung transplant physicians for input and getting their buy-in. So can I go to the next slide? 
So cooperation and collaboration was really key in trying to get this approach um, with all donors at LifeBank kind of off the ground. Um, so it was a proactive approach, uh, going and meeting the, the surgeons and transplant physicians from our centers, and then getting their buy-in once that was done, then education of all the procurement staff, also getting the ICUs uh, to understand and be on board with, like, why are we doing this, and why do you want this APRV, and uh, getting the RTs in the different hospitals to understand. And then uh, working with our surgeons to make sure that we're picking the right recipients for the right donor. Okay. Can I have the next slide? So the first thing was really uh, the mindset. Again, all donors are long donors until proven otherwise. Uh, as I showed you that earlier one page of the, our donor management protocol, uh, within a couple of hours of starting donor management, where this is being instituted and based upon the PF ratios, we're aggressively um, increasing PEEP and uh, going to APRV as necessary. And I can tell you recently, like I think it was last year, we looked at, um, in LifeBank, uh, Dan and I were just curious, what was the average time it took to, when we w went to APRV in terms of um, getting recruitment, um, enough recruitment that PF ratios would improve from you know less than 200 to the over 300 mark. And it took about, um, the mean was about 12 hours. Um, so just something to bear in mind. Um, now when the lungs uh, are felt to be recruited, uh, where our standard gases on the APRV, we've got good PF ratios, then what we would do is uh, make, do the challenge gas. And for that, we would first go to pressure control ventilation, but now an ITE of one to one, and the PEEP of five, and put the oxygen, the FiO2 up to 100%, do that for 30, 30 minutes and get your blood gas so that we could make the offer. And then this was key for us, we feel. Once you had done that, then we return back to the pressure control inverse ratio ventilation, or if we were fine in the middle, you know, people 15 or 12 or whatever it was, we go back to what was our recruitment maintenance uh, strategy. Like I said, neurologically deceased stones, the, the, there's no cough, there's no gag, so you have to maintain this recruitment all the time. Um, can I have the next slide? And what did this uh, show was, if we look on the left graph, we see the mean airway pressure. And as expected, by using APRV more frequently, the mean airway pressure of the donor did increase by you know, a few centimeters of water. Uh, in the orange, you can see the, the post-intervention um, as opposed to the historical controls. And then on the right graph, though, the consequence of this, as we can see on the orange bar, is the PF ratio reaching up over 400 uh, as a mean for uh, donors who were, had lung successfully transplanted as opposed to the mean being just below 300. And then can I go to the next slide? And on the um, x-axis, you can see the years 2005 through to 2009. And the orange line uh, on the y-axis is the percentage of donors that were lung donors. And through 2005 to 8, you can see it, it averaged around the sort of 20% mark, which is how we're all doing now. And you know, after the SALT protocol uh, and other papers showed that's very achievable. But with this protocol in place, there were almost up, it was about 38, 39% of the donors became um, lung donors. So, that was um, very exciting. Can I go into the next slide? And what um, we're able to show in collaboration working with the Cleveland Clinic uh, transplant, Lung Transplant Center was to collect some of the recipient uh, outcomes. And what to take you through this table, we have in the first column, is, it says lung donors. The local is meaning life bank, where this aggressive lung management protocol had been utilized, so that was 38 donors, and we uh, compared them against 119 uh, imports of lungs. We can see for each of the categories for ICU days, 30 day survival, and the incidence of post graft dysfunction at 0, 24, 40, and 72 hours, there was no significant difference between uh, lungs recovered um, in the life bank OPO. Uh, 
area versus those that were imported. And um, I do know that Dan is working with, uh, on a longer term follow-up, he has one in five year data, uh, which they're analyzing and um, I'm okay to say that it actually looks at um, basically the use of this aggressive lung management protocol, although it allowed us to double our lung utilization in terms of outcomes for the recipients, when we compare this group of, uh, sort of life bank local lungs transplanted versus the imported, it was non-inferior. Uh, There's no difference in outcomes uh, at, at even one year and five year. Um, so looking for that paper from Dan very shortly. Have the next slide, please. So the study conclusions from uh, that was that you know utilization of an aggressive lung management protocol incorporating extreme pressure control, inverse ratio ventilation can double your lung donor rate with no apparent effect on recipient outcomes as compared to lungs that were recovered from standard donor management. Can I have the next slide? And since Dan uh, reported that back in uh, uh, 2010, there's actually been uh, several more papers that have shown. Here's one example by Hanna et al. from 2011, um, where they showed a significantly higher lung uh, donation rate for donors managed with APRV. They had 84% versus their assist control ventilation, where it was 18%. And on the graph that I've pulled from that paper, you can see in that box on the right, we have a 12-month and a 36-month outcome uh, for graph survival. Um, it's the, the bar under the 12-month and the 36-month, the bar that to the far right is the ones, uh, the donors that underwent APRV. So even though, it, and they compared it to OPTN sort of um, uh, control data, um, <clears throat> in terms of graph survival. And even though it's higher, it was statistically non-significant. Um, but that increase and that higher use of APRV, uh, one explanation the group gave in their discussion was that the ones who are randomized to APRV, the, um, that donor group had a statistically significant difference in age of about 10 years, which may explain why the percentage of donors was so high. It was like 30 versus 40. Um, so that's a pretty significant difference in age. And that might explain why they were able to get 84%. But this is reassuring again to see that in, in terms of recipients that it did not change um, their outcome. Can we go to the next slide? So I, I kind of hinted at the time it takes for lung recruitment. And is taking this extra time really worth it? So there's a paper by uh, Walter et al. This was in European Journal of Chronic Thoracic Surgery, also in 2011. It was a retrospective review of 400 consecutive donors where lungs were transplanted. Um, when they looked at what was the cause of um, brain death, that had no effect on success of lungs being utilized. The one thing they did find, though, was that when donor management was longer than 10 hours, this resulted in better lung recipient survival. This was 69% versus 58% at five years, and 51% versus 42% at 10 years. And this was statistically significant. So the longer and the better your donor management, the better it is for our recipients. So uh, we should not be shy about taking those extra 12, 24 hours in our donor management to recruit lungs. Um, because this will also be better for the recipient. Can I have the next slide? Um, another article that's uh, more recent um, looked at a meta-analysis of uh, lung management protocols versus no protocol. And uh, they looked at the literature, there was quite a few hundred, but 10 articles were eligible for inclusion where they talked about protocols versus no protocol. And what they were able to show was uh, implementation of a lung management protocol independently led to an odds ratio of 2.56. So that means you're two and a half times more likely to have recovery and transplantation of lungs just by having a lung management protocol for your donor. That was it, just having a protocol in place, not even doing APRV, just having a lung uh, management protocol. And this also translated to increased recipient survival. So just like some of the other data I was showing you, 
um, uh, it supports that. And they show that recipient survival was the odds ratio at one year was 1.82. So 80% more likely uh, more likely to be alive um, than someone who got lungs that didn't have a um, lung management protocol. So that's, that's really kind of interesting. So next slide. Uh, so what other opportunities could there also be um, for improving lung donation? I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that with DCDD, so um, donation after circulatory determination of death, we're not really involved in that potential donor while they're still alive. And actually a paper in 2016 showed that only about 2% of DCD donors are actually lung donors. So this looks like a huge untapped uh, area to improve our um, lung donor rates. Uh, and it's something I think that really helps this is the introduction of ex vivo because um, you know where there's potential DCD donors with borderline PF ratios, I think the um, presence now of ex vivo going from experimental to next phase of trials uh, and many and increasing numbers of centers um, going for this uh, means that hopefully we'll see some improvement in DCD um, lung utilization. The interesting observation that we made at LifeBank was uh, as our local lung center became an EVLP center, we had now surgeons, as when they came out for recovery, they often found that um, when they opened the chest and we kind of took away whatever issues that chest wall or was, uh, was causing in terms of compliance issues, suddenly the lungs would pop open with some simple lung recruitment maneuvers, and they would say, hey, we don't need EVLP. These lungs are actually suitable for transplantation right away. And I remember the last uh, 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 executive director, medical director's meeting um, in uh, New Orleans uh, recently where um, the folks from um, uh, bioengineering, actually, they mentioned that that's been the case as well for them uh, during their study. So that was kind of interesting. One thing that we noticed was this was particularly so for those donors who were obese. Um, so obesity, as we know, is a problem. And the OPTN database shows 34% um, uh, of donors actually have a BMI of more than 29. That means they're obese. And so we would sort of postulate um, and it's known that this higher BMI, there's a, a nice um, short report by um, um, Toshi Akimoto uh, in the American Journal of Transplantation that where they show the higher BMI is associated with lower PF ratio. And so maybe something else about instituting aggressive lung management is that in these ob ob obese donors, we're able to turn marginal into potential lungs. And then with the option of EVLP, we now get recovery surgeons coming out more frequently to assess these lungs. And can I have the next slide? And then I uh, just want to get close to the end now and say, you know, hepatitis C and lung transplantation. And just last week, um, we, uh, so the New England Journal uh, is e publication um, showed that a uh, study that was done of 36 lung recipients um, who received hepatitis C virus positive lungs. Treatment was started within hours of transplantation for four weeks, and basically those recipients were cured and had no evidence of infection, all doing well. There have been earlier sort of case reports as well, including a series of 10 patients by the EVLP team from uh, Toronto, where um, uh, they first assessed the lungs on EVLP to make sure that they were suitable for transplantation from hepatitis C positive donors. And then uh, this is thought to potentially lead to another 1,000 lungs for transplantation in, in North America. Um, I don't know how, whether that figure's a little, it seems pretty big. Um, I know like in Ohio, we've actually, even though we've had the sort of heroin epidemic, uh, last year we saw plateauing and I think interventions are taking place. Uh, I think that number might not hold true, it might actually drop. So, but it's great, I think utilizing hepatitis C organs is for sure going to be important. So can I have the next slide, please? And so to wrap up, my sort of key takeaways, therefore, are that we have the potential to uh, easily double our lung donors and eliminate the waste, wait list for lung transplantation. I think we can take from the 20s up to the 40s and increase our 
lung transplantation from 2,500 to you know, double that. Um, what we need to do is OPOs, in collaboration with our transplant centers, need to treat every donor as a potential lung donor and develop an aggressive lung management protocol that you, and, you know, we would uh, propose using extreme pressure control inverse ratio ventilation as your strategy for recruitment, or APRV, and also the increasing utilization of EVLP and hepatitis C virus, I think, will really help us to achieve this goal. Thanks very much. All right. Thank well, you thanks, so Samir, much, so much for that uh, provocative and thoughtful uh, conversation. And uh, I think there is opportunity, and it certainly exists out there, and you've helped to provide us with some of that information. At this point, we'd like to open up uh, the line for any questions. If anybody has questions, you can type them in. Yes, this is a reminder to everyone, if you do have any questions for Dr. Latifi, um, please reference the chat feature that's located at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Also, during the Q&A session, I will have this poll up. So for those of you who are listening in a group, if you can please complete this poll and let us know how many people are actually in your group, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back to Dan to moderate your question. So I'm not, I'm not seeing any questions popping up on my screen. So I think that, um, Samir, just if I could ask a question then. So in terms of these obese patients that you feel like we're seeing, why, why do you think these patients are um, having success uh, becoming donors with the presence of the EVLP programs? Yeah, so I think um, with an obese donor, the physical habitats uh, of the patient with the, even with aggressive lung strategies, uh, it can be hard to sometimes get resistant areas of atelectasis to open, even with repeat bronchoscopy. And at the time of recovery, but often we can improve it to where it's sort of borderline, and we sort of entice our surgeons to come look as possible EVLP. And what we have heard anecdotally is that once they open the chest and kind of remove that static compliance issues, I, I would say, and the lungs are able to then be recruited more effectively, and then they can get some, you know, blood gases, and they say, hey, you know, this was just, and they can visually see the lungs, and we've been good about all the other management, so, you know, kept the patients euvolemic, it's not too edematous, they can see that now with the chest open, that um, with recruitment maneuvers there in the OR, they and can uh, sort of pop open, it's usually those basal lobes that are getting squished. They can open those up and they say, these lungs look good, the gases are good, and they go straight for transplantation. That's great, thank you so much. There are a couple questions that have popped up. Uh, I'm gonna, not gonna read the, the names of the individuals, but I'll read their questions. So the first question is, great presentation, Dr. Latifi, an issue I've observed in lung placement is a disparity between OPO management strategies and transplant physician surgeon perspective. Uh, surgeons challenge having patients on high PEEP and ask for it to be brought down and state it's not necessary. Can you speak to the disparity on thought processes between these two sides of this? Yes, that is a great question. And I think um, it's not that infrequent that I think uh, when I'm taking call as medical director and we have someone, especially as lung allocation has changed, because I think our local centers, like I said, we'd worked hard to explain what we're doing and sharing results, that as um, transplant centers that historically were not ones that we would send our lungs to get involved, we get these phone calls and says, you're doing what to this donor? You're, these lungs are gonna be no good in my recipient, and we have to say, no, you know, this is what we do. We, we have data that shows um, this does not affect recipient outcomes and allows us to um, maintain recruitment. And the strategy I often take when I speak with like a transplant pulmonologist is explaining the rationales I gave in the slide that, um, you know, we do this recruitment and that we have been able, as the lungs have recruited, even though we're an APRV, we have been able to bring down that P high to you know, this low numbers, and uh, a lot of times it's in the low 20s. And when I explain, this is just CPAP, and we're just doing a sustained inflation um, that 
and you know this is just for a short period, and this is to keep the lungs in as good a shape and prevent repooling of secretions by keeping the alveoli open. Uh, so it, it, it is quite a, a mindset change, and I think as we show more data of those centers that have sort of been, as it were, early embraces, and we have these outcomes at you know five years and show it doesn't impact on lung function or primary graft dysfunction at one year, five year, I, then I think we'll get a lot more buy-in. The other thing is, uh, you know, it's, it's for the borderline PF ratios, as they come out and they're considering EVLP, when I speak to many lung surgeons, they, you know, it's it's how the lung feels in their hands. They can tell it's not edematous, it's not boggy, and 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 it looks good, um, and that's what often does it for the for them. So, you know, the recruitment strategy, getting our PF ratios and someone who was like, you know starting at 100 and we just get up to that for 250, hey, it's enticing for EVLP. They come and I think then they become converts, hopefully. Okay, great. Uh, and the next question is, what is your stance on permissive hypercapnia to facilitate APRV and brain dead organ donors? Any recommendations? Yeah, I... Um, so I think for lungs to be good and with APRV, uh, what I notice, if the lungs are good, CO2 clearance should not be a problem if they're going to be good for transplantation. I tend to get nervous when it's hard to clear the CO2. Um, to me, then, that means there's intrinsic lung disease, and then I, I tend to worry that maybe they're not suitable for transplantation. So I think this is different than an ICU strategy. Um, you know, we're doing this for, you know, 12, 18, 24 hours. In the ICU, it might be someone with ARDS that's there for a week. Um, so uh, that tends to be my thoughts. I don't know, actually, if, Dan, you have any thoughts about that, but it tends to make me nervous when I see we have a neurologically deceased donor. You kind of get used to what kind of settings, like, hey, why can't I clear the CO2? This, there must be some problem, intrinsic lung disease, that makes me reluctant then. Yeah, I agree. I think if your APRV settings are correct and you're looking at your peak excretory flow rates and they're in that sweet spot, um, then, then I would have the same concerns you have. Sometimes I think when people are not using um, this strategy uh, correctly with the ventilator, they can end up with either too short of, a, uh, P, uh, of, a, of an excretory flow rate so that they're not, not being able to eliminate uh, even the small amount of CO2 that's being produced. So that would be one thing I would caution against. And then there is one last question. Um, how do you feel about taking lungs with contusions? Uh, so I can say I'm not the surgeon and, uh, who transplants them. I, tend, I, I think I've noticed um, if it's like a localized area, um, what I hear is that they tend to recover well and it um, should not put you off. And that certainly has been my, my similar experience as well. So I, I think that completes the questions. I see we're a little bit over our time. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to then to Deanna uh, to finish up for us. Thanks so much, Samir, for uh, presenting this topic for us. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, on behalf of the Alliance, I'd also like to ex extend a sincere thanks once again to Dr. Latifi as well as Dan um, for your time and for sharing your expertise on this topic. Um, and to all of our participants, as always, we thank you for your time, and we wish you a wonderful rest of the